party with your host, Dustin Ripka. Hello and welcome to Sex Party. I'm your host, Dustin Ribka. This is episode 44. My guest this week, Catherine Drysdale. She is a sex and relationship coach. She's a lot of fun. She's incredibly smart. Uh, you know the drill on this show. We bring in the best and only the fucking best. Uh, Catherine and I talk about anxiety, ADHD, mental wellness, not just around sex, but around real everyday life, how does that affect things? What can you do to maybe check in with yourself, get a better handle on that, and therefore have better sex and better relationships? We also talk about sex education and the lack thereof and what Catherine wants to do about it. All that and more, this episode is packed. It's great. It's lovely. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Catherine Drysdale. This week's conversation. conversation. Catherine Drysdale, welcome to Sex Party. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? You know, today I am good. It is, uh, I don't know what day it is, but it is uh, unseasonably warm. Thank you, climate change. We're grateful for, for the uh, apocalyptic weather in November, but it feels good. So I'm good. Where, where are you based right now? <laughs> I am in Chicago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Where are you? I'm in Austin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're so used to like. So it's been unseasonably warm for like since. A hundred years. May. <laughs> it's been a hundred degrees for like four months and now it's like uh, 60, 70, 80. And then, yeah, it's like raining. Well, no, today's not raining, but it's been raining, but also still like muggy and like hot. And I'm like, not about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's that post midterm depression weather, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. So for the people who don't know who you are, um, and they don't, uh, they haven't seen you before in the audience, right? They haven't heard your voice. Could you talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Cause I love it. Yeah. So my name is Catherine Drysdale. I'm a sex and relationship coach. Um, I went through certification through Sexual Health Alliance, um, and part of that is I wanted to make sure I had all the tools in order to eventually, one of my missions is to help revolutionize sex education for children and doing so through ASECT. Um, but essentially what I do and sort of my mission is I'm here to help people experience more pleasure in their lives. I have a very pleasure-focused self-discovery lens when it comes to sex and sexuality. So allowing my listeners, my clients, et cetera, to really take a step back and figure out what it is that you want and desire within your sex life, whether that's an individual experience, whether that's with a partner, multiple partners, because when we're able to think about what we want <laughs> and give ourselves what we want, it makes it easier to communicate with our partners and then have the sex that you really want. It, it all really like I'd say 90% of it is a communication thing. Okay. So, and, and, and I have a lot of smart, talented people on the show like yourself, right? And we get that same, almost the same exact answer mm -hmm. all the time. And here's, here's why that answer is fucking amazing because it is so true. Um, and I'm finding out like even in my personal life that when you communicate um, or you think you're communicating, you're really like, there's a lot more you can be doing. And that lends itself to sex and intimacy and um, the fear that comes with both like so much that I think let's drill down on this communication thing real quick, like even more, let's like turn the fucking, mm -hmm. uh, the screw, the knife, whatever violent thing we want to mm -hmm. uh, use as an analogy. But um, I, I just think that people can be more honest and it's terrifying, I think, for a lot of people. Um, are you seeing that? Um, do you agree with me? Am I just crazy? And how do we get better about communicating? <laughs> no, not crazy. Not crazy at all. Um, it's funny because 
I actually, back in like March, April, I went viral on TikTok because I was talking about something called desire discrepancy, also known as like mismatched libido. And like I grew 130,000 followers within 30 days, nice. um, 16 million views, which is insane. But like, <laughs> if we take it all back, that just shows that people feel like they're alone in their relationships. They feel like they're not able to communicate with their partners. They feel like they're not able to express their needs, their desires. Um, but what's crazy is like, we're all experiencing this. <laughs> it is so universal. And that's why this content went viral. That's why it continues to go viral and it continues to create these conversations because Ultimately, we, especially in long term relationships, a lot of people feel uncomfortable or unsafe in expressing their especially kinks, let's say, or um, sexual desires that they think are kind of like weird or taboo. They're afraid that the person that they love and loves them back will not accept them for who they are or will judge them for that. So that's why oftentimes um, they're using porn as an avenue to like explore their kinks, which I'm a huge supporter of porn. I think it's great, but everyone needs to figure out what their own like boundaries are within porn use or um, boundaries just within a relationship need to look like. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a communication thing, but the number one is like, we need to understand and define what pleasure is for ourselves. We need to give ourselves permission to experience pleasure. And then we need to speak up if something's not working or if we want something added to it. Um, so it's just, it's kind of like a, a muscle. It's like learning how to ride a bike. You know, we're having sex. We could be having decent sex. We could even be having great sex, but it can always, it can always get better. And it gets better when we give ourselves permission to sort of like drop, <laughs> drop the bullshit and like talk to our partners like face to face. Hey, I really love it when you do this, but like, can we try this instead? Or let's shift this. Or how do you feel about role play? Can we do a student teacher kind of thing? Like there's like ways that we can bring into like talking about our desires in a way that might feel like less scary if that makes sense you know you you said some really interesting things like from the beginning and out to me it almost looks like a, a triangle not a love triangle but uh a, a triangle nonetheless right so like here we have this piece about you wanting sex education for children to be better so this is sort of the the start and then down here it's people in long-term relationships then over here is this fear they all correlate they're all the same thing the same problem so do you think with that being said right um that this awkwardness this weird um they're all gonna laugh at you uh don't show anybody anything and whatever from a kid uh starts there and then it follows you into your your relationships right so um is that yeah. what's is that what's happening is that why you want to go back and change the shitty fucking lack of education that that kids get um about around sex yeah i mean in a nutshell yes um absolutely i feel like sex education has failed us um just like globally we're kind of fucked um and a lot of us i mean that's the one good part about this like age of technology where we have greater access to information and like gen z is able to go on like TikTok or go online to like research stuff, even on like gender identity and like sexual norms and all of this stuff. They have more access to information that even I, as a millennial, like I'm about to be 30, like, yeah, porn was there, but there wasn't much that I could research when I was in high school starting to have sex. You know, I had to kind of learn, we had basic sex education. If that in middle school, we were taught what a period was and how to use a tampon. And then in high school, it was like one single health class where they teach you not to have sex, what STDs can look like when they're really bad, and how to put on a condom. But what I'm really here to do and here to teach is that like, what we're missing is holistic and well-rounded and comprehensive sex education that includes emotional regulation. This includes like understanding what healthy relationship dynamics 
are. This includes like consent culture, understanding that consent like needs to be enthusiastic and needs to be a hell yes or it's a no. Ambivalence is a no. It needs to be understanding like what gaslighting is, what love bombing is, understanding that our dysfunctional relationships with our family members can impact how we seek attachment like as adults. This also is like from a pleasure standpoint, we're not taught that sex gets to be pleasurable. We're taught from a heterocentric view that sex is penetration, a penis inside a vagina, and that's it. And it's done when the penis owner comes, which leaves the whole LGBTQ community out of the conversation. And everyone just like is floundering most of us learn from experience or by porn but porn also doesn't teach us these things because porn is entertainment so it's like this whole system is fucked and it's like how do we change it and for me at least I think it's like by creating sex education for the younger generation so that they can make more informed decisions about what it feels right for them and what doesn't feel right for them. Does that make sense? And like that all ends up feeding into who we are as adults and how we interact in relationships, sexual or otherwise. Yeah, I feel like my screen is is melting from like the heat coming off you right now because you're like, fuck yeah, man. <laughs> like very, very passionate. Fuck yeah. Like and I and and we love that here. Like I'm such a fan. Um, and there's so many, there's so many, like, uh, the whole time we're talking, I just wanted to be like, fuck yeah, you know, <laughs> or like take a lighter out or something. Um, but I totally agree with you. And it's a big reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and trying to have fun with it and like, you know, pump one third or one fourth of, of that, what you just said out there, you know, even <laughs> because I feel really, um, I feel really inspired by by that same kind of like rock and roll energy with sex because that's that's what it's going to take I think for anything to move and you're right like Gen Z is uh when they get to to be older like I feel really happy for them because hopefully they'll be horny and it'll be cool and accepted and they can say I'm horny and would you like to have sex that it'll be a very easy conversation because the stuff that was done to our generation and all the generations prior Jesus, I mean, you know, that's one hell of a uh, of a casserole full of hair. Um, no idea where that came from. It's very gross, but that's out there now. So casserole <laughs> full of hair, visual, yeah. yeah. But mm. it, it's a it's a night yeah. it's a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. And and I think that um, I think that you wanting to go back and do something about it speaks volumes about the need it speaks volumes about you it speaks volumes about your work so i fucking love that and anything i can do to help i'm here for um completely that being said you know with sex education they try to impose this sort of will or or idea uh, upon everyone um you know i i tell the story about how when I was in high school, you know, the teacher tried to put a condom on a banana and then somebody, some asshole kid like told their parents they felt weird or something. And then there was news reporters all over the front lawn of the school and it was a big banana trial or something or whatever. Right. Uh, so that happened. But I think now what's crazy is there are people like you. There are people like me. Right. Who are talking about sex and trying to have fun with it and, and have a positive message, but still, you know, have, have, have fun. Right. And now you have platforms like Instagram, like TikTok, that are just totally blocking that and shadow banning and doing all of these things. So it's the same thing being done by someone else in power now. Um, how, a, how does that feel? And B, what the fuck do we do about that? <sighs> I feel like that's such a loaded question. Yeah, um, well, loaded, loaded <laughs> is. Like, <ooh. laughs> yeah, I mean, how do I feel about it? It sucks, absolutely, especially being so passionate about this work because, like, I, I almost feel like, especially for sex education for kids, I know this is going to be like a lifelong journey. And I don't even know if I'm going to see the fruits of that labor in this lifetime. Like, that's really how I feel about it is like, I'm here to build and create a legacy to revolutionize sex education as we know it. And like, that's going to take decades. 
And like, I'm okay with that because like in order for things to change, like it's going to take a long time to lay the bricks, lay the foundation. And so my focus right now is like providing sex education, like bite-sized content, trying to go about things like on social media. So like skirting around stuff on like TikTok is my platform of choice. And I've been lucky enough to work with TikTok directly for the last two years. So that's really helped me in figuring out, okay, how do I navigate the language that I use like on videos? How can I avoid getting my stuff taken down? Um, That's also shifted into me launching. I also have a marketing agency where I support sex-based businesses on growing their brand, on branding, on marketing, on content strategy. Um, like using what I've learned growing my brand here because notoriously, like (laughs) we are shadow banned. We are um, having difficulties with like running ads. Like I know my business name, I can't run, I can't run ads like on Facebook. So because it's so problematic, it's like we almost have to be more resourceful. And I think that's sort of what I've adapted into is like learning, okay, if I can't do it this way, what's another way that I can do that? And I know before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about the app Moan. Um, and Moan is this amazing like audio-based app that my good friend Kale Jones started. And the whole reason behind it was to provide a platform where there's no censorship, where you can have open flowing conversations about sex, whatever that looks like, whether it's coming at a more like educational, like type of conversation or enthusiasts or people wanting to have a late night, like audio circle jerk. <laughs> like mm-hmm. if you're in the cuckold community, like there's people there. If you're in the LGBTQ community, there's people there. If you just want to talk about sex, if you just want to moan while you're faffing, like that's fine too. <laughs> like, and so it's like, how do we find communities and resources so that we can have these conversations so we can sort of like skirt around the censorship and how can we sort of shift that shift the conversations and shift the narrative because these conversations are really important so I mean that's really that's what I'm doing I'm trying to partner with people who have a similar mission and either have like the resources or platforms to help me do that and help others do that in the space yeah and I think that's huge that's um you know moan is a it, it, things like that are crucial now. I, I think the larger question is, though, is when do you think it's going to stop? At what point do you think platforms like Instagram, TikTok, um, they're like, oh, you know, we we shouldn't get so uptight about uh, a woman's nipple. Uh, we shouldn't fucking freak out if someone wants to talk about consensual sex. Like, because... You know, spelling, uh, having a show called Sex Party, uh, I totally know what you mean with the ads and with with everything. But like having to put dashes between the the S and the E and 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 spelling sex instead of S E X, it's S E G G S. It's like it's it's a little uh, tedious. It's a little ridiculous. It feels insanely disrespectful i'm a i'm a man doing this i can't imagine what it's like to be a woman and so that pisses me off when does it stop that i i don't know when it stops i think i like i don't want to be a pessimist but like i feel like it's going to get worse before it gets better a lot of what goes into it is like politics number one and like depending on where you are in the country and the world like unfortunately our leaders impact like what restrictions are placed on us whether that's in a school setting and then obviously like businesses like you know uh facebook and instagram and all of these like billionaires buying into all these like tech platforms it's like they're all working together in some sort of capacity. So it's like, when are things going to change? I don't know. I really don't know. And I feel like, I mean, we're seeing this right now with the U S election and like midterms and stuff like that. Like, like even sex education doesn't have to be medically accurate. And I think it's like 20 out of 20 out of 50 States, sex education is medically accurate. 
So that means like when we have rhetoric around um, religion (laughs) in education, it's like until we're able to remove that, things aren't going to change on a wide scale, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it, again, it, it goes back to this uh, why question, right? Like, we know it's politics, we know it's religion, but like, even deeper, it's like, but why? You know what I mean? Like, why are you got you assholes? Why are you old white dudes like still holding on to this shit? I mean, because we've seen sex is good for business. I mean, how many times have we been told sex sells? Uh, and and you know that like the sex toy industry, you know better than anyone is just like you know. I'm mm-hmm. sure. I'm sure. Right. Uh, every time I hear about it from someone on the show it's it's just wild to me so if the money's there if the pleasure's there i just feel like you know and i'm getting a little like conspiracy ask here but like i just feel like there's more to it oh totally i'm like i don't (laughs) think people know this part of me i'm like i didn't think i was a conspiracy (laughs) theorist until uh covid happened and i'm like oh wait yes um i see receipts for everything um (laughs) but no going into that um have you seen the new documentary i think it's called god forbid on hulu I have not. Watch it. Okay. <laughs> Watch it. But I think that will help you see sort of like, and for anyone listening to, it's like help you see sort of the picture of like why this is happening. Essentially like, yeah, it is a structure put in place based by politicians with like religious undertones, but a lot of it is like shame, shame based, right? And so even if we know that sex sells, even if we know sex is good for business, even if we know that sexual health is physical health, is emotional health, is all of that, even though we know all of this, a lot of the times it's like so deeply ingrained in our society that even the people who seem to be the strictest lawmakers, if you know what I'm saying, like they have some skeletons in the closet. Fuck yeah. They have a lot of skeletons in the closet. Yeah. And so it's just not like shaming anyone's like sexual kinks and desires, but oftentimes, like we'll see that people who have the deepest, darkest desires feel so much shame around it. And so they want to restrict even more for everyone else around because they don't feel comfortable in being who they are and expressing themselves. Um, so they like keep it close to them instead of what in reality what's gonna change it is <laughs> letting everyone have the education and be who they are but it's just it, it's gonna take time it's gonna take years it's gonna take decades i don't I, I don't know why or when or how but i would definitely recommend watching that documentary oh yeah for sure i don't want to like give i don't want to give too much away <laughs> no i mean you're speaking my mine and the audience's language with that because they're you know and, and lately like we've been talking more about like why it's so bad like and, and we we get into the more conspiracy ask stuff, but uh, there are some really true, real questions there, you know, and, and and it would make sense that, you know, people who are, are, or maybe there's a system put in place where it's like, well, I can't have poor people having orgasms. That's just going to lead to a total uprising. No one's going to want to work or whatever dumb thing they came up with. Right. It doesn't mean there's not still a shell of it there in politics and religion and all that fucking wacky shit. Right. Um, so, so moving on from there and, and we touched on, you know, we, we touched on anxiety and fear a little bit cause it's all baked into that craziness. What's great about you, I think, and, and we've talked a little bit about this on the show, but, um, this will be kind of great to, to, to really get, uh, messy with it because what I love about your content is it, there seems to be a recurring theme in your stuff, whether it's reels or posts, mainly reels, I think. But this level of truth that you present about yourself and and like mental health, right? Um, depression, anxiety, ADHD. So I'm wondering because I really wanna I really wanna tackle this uh, in relation to relationships and sex and self care and all mm-hmm. those things. Talk about did did that decision to share that? Did that come naturally? Did you struggle with that about sharing on like uh, or or because I feel like there's a lot of us you know, walking around with these, with these demons and it's, it's really tough. And then when you go through a fucking pandemic, uh, and you're locked up and you're not sure and this and that, then you're kind of released back into it. into the wild. Um, it's, it's really not just difficult, but torturous almost and painful. So can you talk about your decision to share it and, and, um, 
and and how difficult or maybe not difficult that was yeah i mean i will say like many of you like gosh i've struggled with my mental health literally for pretty much my whole life i started going to therapy when i was 10 years old um i attempted suicide when i was 13 um and i've yeah i've struggled on and off with depression and anxiety basically since i was 10 um i have experienced <laughs> like sexual trauma too and all of this sort of like compounded and really it's it's funny because i feel like i experienced all of this um so that i could be a leader in this space so that i could be relatable so i could share my story and like i had a mental breakdown when i was leaving my job in entertainment i used to do digital publicity for film had a total mental breakdown quit my job, went to therapy, went back to school for digital marketing, thought I was going to get an MBA. And there was a personal branding class, like how to become an influencer. I was trying to make my dog Instagram famous. And <laughs> the first night of class, like the professor said, there's a difference between having influence and having impact. That was the light bulb moment for me that realized, fuck, why am I spending three to four hours a day on my dog's Instagram? Like, I grew her page like really well. Like she was a brand ambassador, but I was like, this isn't the legacy that I want to leave on the world. So my light bulb was like, okay, I've experienced so much pain, so much trauma, so many challenges in my life. So how can I use my life's journey to make people feel less alone? And that's sort of what it first started as was sort of like my Instagram was like, my personal blog in a way, like sharing my mental health struggles. Then I decided to get certified as a life coach. Then I got into like NLP and hypnosis. Then I got into like sex coaching and sort of my decision to go the sex coaching route over becoming a sex therapist is most of our interactions that we have with therapists in general it can be pretty sterile in nature, right? A lot of the times they're just a sounding board for you, wanting you to come to your own conclusions and not sharing a lot about their lives. And for me, it took a long time to feel connected to my therapist. And I think I was seeing her for three years before I even shared about my sexual trauma. And like, I, I realized I was like, okay, what journey do I have to go in order to create the biggest impact? And for me, it seemed like a no brainer. Like I knew I was like, fuck, I need to share my story. But it's like scary to share something that's so intimate and so raw, because you're like, I don't know how people are going to react to that. But that's also like, all of the feedback that I've gotten from any client that's booked a session with me, a bunch of people on social media, like commenting, it's like people resonate with me because I'm real and I'm raw and I'm sharing my own struggles because it's like, we have to see, I think it's like helpful to see ourselves in someone and see ourselves in the person that we want to like lead us in whatever capacity, even if it's just education, you know? And I think we don't talk about how intertwined like mental health is with physical health with relationships. We don't talk about how hard it can be if you're experiencing depression when you have a partner versus not. Like, There's just so much that is challenging that we just don't have enough like community around. And that's sort of like why I decided to do this. It's still hard for me. Like, gosh, I didn't post for like a month, maybe longer. And I just felt called. I was like, I am going to cry. <laughs> on TikTok and Instagram and I'm going to share that I'm really depressed right now and hopefully it's going to resonate with people and like it did like but it just shows that like we need to talk more about of our experiences in order to change them right it's like the more we talk the more we communicate the more society changes the more it's more normalized the more we'll feel less alone well, first of all, a uh, round of applause for, for that because I think that's so incredibly powerful and um, I, I want to say thank you for fucking sharing all that with me um, and, the, and whoever may be listening or watching. Um, that's just giant and I really, truly appreciate that uh, too. Sorry to hear about uh, you know your, your, you suffering and, and self-harm. That is never 
fun or ideal or whatever. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that, but it does sound like you were able to wrangle that fucking uh, stuff and and sort of bend it at least to your will enough to let it be the battery that powered um, your your thought process and your mission on what you want to do. And I think that's um, it, what a fucking cool story when, when you look at it through that lens, right? Like the, you know, trying to build content and an empire for your dog and then being like, no, I have fucking more to give. It's, this isn't my legacy. Yeah. And then where do I look for inspiration? Oh, my goddamn pain, because we all have that. <laughs> And no, yeah. and no one is talking about it. And here we are today doing that. And I could not be more grateful to be uh, to have you on the show and have you doing it and to be to be listening um, and doing it with you because I think that's Aww. that's that's truly truly giant. And that comes across so much in your content. And that's why I was like, I have to get her on the show because she's doing the sex um, and relationship coaching and content stuff, and it's fun, right? You have a lot of videos where you're like dancing around, like falling down, getting injured, <laughs> um, which I, which I think yeah. are like super fucking fun, right? Because I'm like kind of a klutz myself. I usually stand up from this and like bang into the wall, like damn it, you know. Um, and so I, I love that. But then there's this other piece, um, and anybody who watches this show knows that it's it's sort of a tightrope walk between uh, value and chaos, and so. I saw that in your content and I'm like, I was so impressed and so inspired by that. And so I'm really, really happy that, um, that you're doing that. That being said, you said nobody, um, understands or is taking seriously something along those lines of the, the connection between mental and physical health in relationships, right? Let's fucking slam that one. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what a lot of us don't, I mean, Obviously, right now, we're in this beautiful time of society where mental health is more widely accepted. We know the importance of it. We've experienced a pandemic. Um, therapy and mental health has been more accessible than it has been in recent years. However, we I feel like we still don't understand like the gap and the bridge that we need between our own individual mental health. And like, it's like how we're feeling in our mind, but it's also that also relates to our bodies. And I don't know if you've experienced depression, but like, for me, it's like, when I'm depressed, it's like, I not only feel like shit emotionally, but it's like, I don't want to exercise. I don't want to shower. I don't want to brush my teeth. I think of a depression I had maybe a year or two ago, I wasn't brushing my teeth and I had three cavities by the time I went to the dentist. And so obviously when you feel like shit, you're not taking care of your body, how is that going to impact your relationships, right? And let's say, for example, you're living with a partner and you just like kind of are chugging through just trying to fucking take care of yourself. And it's so hard to even get up and like change from your evening sweatpants to your daytime sweatpants, you know, like that sometimes is a really hard task. You're like, mm, I'm smelling a little ripe right now. Let me at least like change my underwear, you know? And it's just like when you're living with a partner who's going through that, or maybe you're both going through a similar journey where someone's feeling depressed and the other is feeling anxious, feeling like, oh, well, fuck, like, I can't help my partner. Like, I feel less than if my partner is experiencing this. But I feel like a lot of the times, like, our relationships can become like enmeshed where we feel like our identity is based around how our partner feels and vice versa, where we feel like obligated to help them to pull them out. And it's like, it's this fine line of like, we want to support our partners, we want to support um, each other. But it's like, someone's mental health journey that has to be their own, they have to be the one wanting to get help. You can be supportive, but it's not it's not your fault that your partner is depressed or vice versa. And like, if you're the one that's experiencing the depression or the anxiety, it's not your partner's job to fix you period. Yeah. No. And like, and that is something that, um, again, people say a lot, right. Uh, but in practice, it's the same thing that we were talking about earlier about communicating better. Like think about, you know, let's take word by word, like, talk about what you want all of those things same way with this it's like you can say all day 
it's not your problem. It's not like you, people need to fix their own mm -hmm. problems and not put it on their partner. But that has to be practiced. You have to really truly mm -hmm. practice doing that. And I think it just gets lost in the wash of words on on social and in real life when when someone's like saying that to another person or or trying to to live that. So what's something tangible that they that they could do like practical ways to help yeah. yeah totally totally i'd say number one like if let's say if you have a partner that's experiencing depression like i think the first step is just like hold space and validate their emotions right if you haven't experienced depression yourself you probably have no idea how they're feeling even if you have you still don't know how someone's feeling so i think First step is really opening up the conversation, asking them, how are you feeling? What do you need? Is there anything that I can help you with? Because one person's needs might be different than yours or someone else's. Like your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner's needs might be different than maybe a friend that you had in middle school that went through a tough time, you know? And our needs can change day to day. It can be like you can offer suggestions like, okay, for you to feel better, if there's ways that I can help you feel better, like what are some things I can do? Would it be helpful if I picked up the groceries? If I did the laundry? If I like left some little notes for you? Do you want me to help you make an appointment so that you can get support with a therapist? So it's like opening the conversation, asking how they're feeling, and then support them on what they need in that journey to just like get going because they're the ones that has to actually do that work but we can still support our partners in creating that and then when it comes to like intimacy obviously for a lot of like relationships like physical intimacy like sexual intimacy is usually the first to go when there's extra stress and mental illness in a relationship and like it can be hard to want to connect physically in that way when you just feel like such absolute shit about yourself. So ways to combat that or move around that is, you know, same kind of thing as I recommend my clients for anyone who's experiencing desire discrepancy in relationships. That's basically what it is. And it's figuring out, okay, what's the root of this? But it's like, okay, what are some other ways where I can help you feel loved or feel desired, even if it doesn't lead to sex? It could lead to foreplay. It could lead to cuddling. It could lead to like a naked intimate shower together, right? It doesn't have to be sex, but it's like the more that we spend that time, that energy focusing on connection and support, the more that's going to end up leading into wanting to build back that sexual intimacy, if that makes sense. No, to, yeah. It's, was that tangible enough? Yeah, I know. It's super <laughs> tangible. And, and, uh, and I thank you for that because, you know, I feel like sometimes people will hear something that they relate to and then they'll be like, well, wait, what about, what do I do? You know? So that's fucking great. And I appreciate that. And I, and, and I think, you know, depression, anxiety, ADHD, I mean, any of those things, um, they all harm the same way, right? They, they, they are all painful to experience. They're all painful to watch someone that you love go through that. Um, even if you don't love them, even if you just like them, it's still a little difficult. Uh, and so, I think it's really important to to get you on record to to give tangible kind of little little tips that they can start with. Um, you know, I think it, it, the conversation is opening up. People are talking about it. We people like us are having conversations like this, but sometimes that's not enough, right? Sometimes you're not even aware that you're experiencing depression or anxiety. So, so what can someone do? Um, on their own, uh, maybe to check in with themselves? Like, is there anything that, that you do that you, maybe you want to give them? Yeah, totally. Um, I will say like, for me personally, I like I'm in the business of, ple of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Like my whole brand is pleasure. My whole brand is it's your pleasure path. But that's like, to me, that's like my like lighthouse, if that makes sense. So it's like, if I am in the business of pleasure, and that is the mission my why of like what I'm doing is living a life of pleasure and helping others live a life of pleasure. I check in with myself. If I'm not, if I look at my life and I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling anxious, I'm not living pleasure. 
then that's a huge indication to me of, okay, I'm out of alignment. I'm not feeling good, whether it's just like a daily thing or like a depression thing. Um, For me, I think it's helpful, number one, to define like what pleasure means to you. I really like looking at pleasure more holistically outside of the sexual lens of like, for me, pleasure is making my oat milk latte in the morning, sitting up on the rooftop pool, and having five minutes to myself or meditating. It's been months since I've done that consistently. And like that used to be my anchor task that I did every single morning that grounded me. Like uh, not spending time outside, not exercising, um, not doing little things that you enjoy. Like I wasn't buying my weekly flowers anymore. I wasn't um, hanging out with friends. I was just feeling so drained, so depleted. So it's like, First of all, making a list, I think, of like what brings you pleasure, what are small things that you can do that make you pleasure, even like my self-pleasure, my masturbation practice. I wasn't doing that consistently and I didn't want to. And I'm very much in like, I practice consent with myself. So it's like, if I'm not into it, I'm not going to do it. Even if I know it's good for me, I respect my no, just like I want my partners to respect my no, but it's like understanding, okay, what are my daily habits that I need to have in order to feel good? And also, okay, why am I not doing these? And then, okay, what is one habit that I can create that might not feel good right now, but can help me go on the path of like where I want to go and how I can feel better? Does that make sense? It's like, giving yourself a little like temperature check. Yeah, I think you said a a ton of really great stuff. Again, um, you're just like a slot machine. Like you ask a question and you just keep (laughs) fucking winning here, uh, which is great for everyone involved. Um, And and I think one of the things you did say that I found fascinating and intriguing and resonated with me was the getting consent with yourself. Because I know me as a guy and how I am, it's like – oh, maybe we should jerk off today. And it's like, nah, I don't know. And it's like, wait a minute. We don't want to jerk off. Something's wrong with us. You're And like, oh, you go down this fucking anxiety-driven rabbit hole from hell. And so I could imagine that that happens with a lot of people, especially if they have uh, OCD or anxiety or both or whatever, because you start to beat up on yourself. Um, and and that's never a great thing for pleasure at all. So I love that you said that. Um, and you can say more about it if you want. But my question is, overall, for someone who anxiety or not, depression or not, ADHD or not, how important is this practice of consistent self-love, self-care, self-check-in? It's the non-negotiable. It really is, regardless of where you on are in your journey, regardless of what your mental health looks like right now, like having consistent daily self care and self love is crucial, whether or not you're in a relationship. And like, I think also, there's this huge misconception that self care is like bubble baths and face masks. And why yes, like that definitely can be a part of it. Self care can be letting yourself walk outside spending five minutes in the sun. It can be going the long route on your commute from home just because you like to see the fall foliage and like the leaves falling down. It can be like maybe saying no to hanging out with someone who drains you. Like that gets to be self-care. Self-care gets to be boundaries and expectations that we have for ourselves as well as the people in our lives. Yeah. And like you're right. It's something small, right? Like uh, taking a fucking extra five minutes when no one's looking and stepping outside or jamming your favorite tune more than once, you know, in your, in your AirPods mm-hmm. bonus points, you use the word foliage. So we're going to give you five bonus points <laughs> on the, on the board for that. Love that word. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Bing. Um, yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, to stay on this track of self-care, uh, anxiety, partnership, you know, you, you had, I, I believe it was a real, uh, cause you have a lot of really, uh, killer ones. Everybody who's on the show is just like killing the reels game. And then there's my reels game. Aww. And it's like, mine's terrible. Eh? Um, but we're working on it. Uh, you had one that was talking about how people are always, and I'm very guilty of this. If, you, if anybody has listened or watched before, I'm constantly saying like, I'm very gross. I have gross fantasies. And you had this piece of content that was about people thinking their fantasies are gross, but also 
um, or dirty or wrong, right? And sometimes like that's part of the fun. But um, judging yourself on your fantasies, but then being afraid to share them with your partner. So instead of asking the the normal question, we'll we'll go a little left of center and ask how important um, is sharing your dark, deep, uh, intimate, personal fantasies with your partner? And is there a, is there like a, a bullseye way to do it? I think, I mean, just like everything, it's so highly subjective. So I think it's like number one, figuring out, is this a fantasy or is this a desire? And I think we don't have the distinction between the two. A fantasy is something that we might, um, think about when we're masturbating or maybe there's a consistent thing that you look up when you're watching porn or maybe you're watching a movie or a tv show and something's happening or reading a smut book or whatever there's all sorts of different media that can show us and create that interest there but where it becomes a desire is the desire is something that you want to create in your reality so i'd say if if it's just a fantasy and something you think about you don't have to share it with your partner if that's not something you want to bring into your reality. If you do want to bring it into your reality, then think about, okay, how important is this desire? Is this something that I really want to have happen? Is it a non-negotiable for me? Is it not? Will I be okay if my partner doesn't like it? And I think there's also this like catch 22. It's like, we should feel comfortable sharing our desires with our partners, but also on the same side of the, or the other side of the coin, it's like, we shouldn't pressure our partner to be into something that, that they're not. And so like, there's also ways to navigate, okay, if maybe you are someone who is interested in cuckolding, maybe, and you really have this cuck fantasy, and it's like, it, it's, it's becoming more popular lately. Um, but <laughs> more, a lot of people are into it and like, that's okay. So let's say you're into mm -hmm. cuckolding and you really want to explore having a cuckold dynamic. You want to be more submissive in the bedroom. Um, you want to explore more dynamics of like humiliation and shame and having your partner live out their most sexually expressed lives. Amazing. We love that. But maybe your partner, you mm -hmm. share that with them and they're feeling a little apprehensive about it. So there's ways to go about sort of, again, just like you check in with your self temperature check, you can check in with the desire or integrate certain aspects of it. So I think number one, it's like doing a yes, no, maybe checklist with your partner is really key to see like what consistent desires you have to see how you can do that. Like for me, for example, like I tend to attract a lot of submissive men. I didn't realize until more recently, I'm actually more dominant in the bedroom than I thought. But <laughs> a lot of these submissive men really like humiliation and degradation. But I am not because I internalize if someone's saying something bad or mean, I feel like shit myself. So I'm into exploring the sort of submissive side of that and being more dominant, but I don't want to say mean things. And so it's like you can navigate, okay, what part of this dynamic does make sense, does make your partner feel good. Maybe it's not having them be fucked by someone and you watching and cleaning up after. Like that that could be great, whatever. But maybe it's you go out to a bar and you let your partner sit at the bar and let someone else buy them a drink or flirt with someone or dance with someone. There's like ways to go about integrating your sexual desire without um, like bulldozing your partner's needs and consent, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, two things. One, I hope these fuckers are taking <laughs> notes because like the value is like off the chart in this episode. It's like, you know, way in the green, like, come on. So I hope they're taking notes. And and two, what do you think it was about your personality or or whatever that was attracting oh. Uh, submissive dudes I think that I'm like confident uh, well spoken I take up space um, and I think that just naturally I attract men who sort of want to be dominated or want to be kind of like nurtured in a way because I feel like that really is the underlying theme is 
maybe a lot of these men are dominant in their lives, but don't want to be dominant in the bedroom. They want to be cared for. They want to be nurtured. They want to let down their walls. And for a long time, that's also what I sought in a partner is I wanted someone strong and like able to protect and provide and like lead the way. But I realized I was like, I actually don't want that at all. (laughs) So it's like, finding this balance because also it's like my desire in a relationship is partnership and equality and balance but in the bedroom it's like those dynamics can shift and i think also like deconditioning like what we think is the norm for gender roles too and i know that's definitely flipped the switch for any like lgbtq relationships or same sex or non-binary or whatever it's like when the dynamic has shifted, like you get to create like what you want and what you don't. Like I have like fantasy desires of like a partner taking care of me and never having to work a day in my life. But I also have a fantasy of having a stay at home husband who cooks and takes care of the kids and does everything. So it's like, I can see all of them, (laughs) you know? Um, But yeah, it's just, we get to define what's right for us. And that's something that we get to give ourselves permission to change and evolve within partnership or even explore when we're newly dating people or exploring hookups and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting um, that people think that it has to be black or white. It has to be one way or the other. And, and you can with yourself and with the the right partner, with the right, um, you know, uh, system of, of asking questions and, and, and actually and fucking listening. Right. Cause that's just as important as, as anything, but I think you can have a combination of, of all sorts of things in any kind of relationship. And I just don't think people, I don't know. I think we're still kind of stuck in, in, um, the old way, like the, I feel like the rom-coms and we've talked about this, uh, to, to fucking so 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 much on the show but like we've sort of been poisoned by that a little bit and and i feel like we're still trying to break to break free of that i mean and i think we're in the right going in the right direction and with people like you like we stand a fighting (laughs) chance right um that being said just to jump back to the beginning of that question are there things that someone may not uh is not a good idea or may not want to share with their partner desire and um you know, fantasy wise things that they don't, that they shouldn't share with their, like, is it a good, yeah. Is there, is there anything that's like, uh, that's okay. If you want to keep that to yourself, because I feel like a lot of times we talk about, Oh, make sure you're honest and you're sharing or whatever. But I don't think we talk enough about things that are okay to keep to yourself or maybe a better idea to keep. Is there anything like that? Or is that just like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all personal preference. It's all completely subjective. Um, I do think, uh, yeah, as important as honesty is in a relationship and open communication, you're also not obligated to share everything with your partner. You're not obligated if you have some weird thought of something that might be like, kind of like not seen as like, okay, or like extra taboo. And you're like, Mm -hmm. fuck, like, is my partner going to judge me? But it was just like a one time thought, like, fuck like should I share it should I not like you don't have to share it if you don't want to it's completely up to you I do think um like you don't have to share everything in your relationship that doesn't make you a bad person that doesn't make you like weird or like secretive but I would say if there's something that you do want to create in your reality communicate that with your partner and there's ways to go about that I really like using like media as a tool to start that conversation because it makes it less about you and more objective, if that makes sense. So it's like using maybe like something that you've seen in TV or porn or a book and saying like, Hey, I saw this scene. It's really hot. It turned me on. Like, what are your thoughts? You know? So then that's a way to like temperature check and be like, okay, like, are you into it? Are you not? And then that sort of can give you an indication if you want to open the door more to create it into your reality. Cause if it's like a hell no full body stop from your partner, then maybe just end the conversation there. But also I think it's important to know that like, it's okay to hire professionals too. If there's something that you want to experience, that's why pro doms exist. That's why sex Mm -hmm. work exists. It's like, your partner could be not okay with something and that's totally okay and valid. But if there's something that you need to try or want to try, communicate that with your partner 
but maybe the solution is hiring a pro. Maybe the solution is maybe you want to experience more of a polyamorous or open relationship, but your partner just wants one. One partner can be monogamous, the other can be poly, but there's ways to go about navigating that conversation so that it's like ethical and fair and great communication and everyone feels like their needs are met. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. I know I probably uh, unboxed another door. (laughs) No, no, no. It's great. It's great because I think, you know, the reason why I asked you that is because we talk a lot about hey, you should share this and you should be more open and this is how progress happens and this is how everyone gets fucking to come and all the things, right? But we don't talk about it. Some people are so anxiety-driven the other way where they feel like they need to share everything with their partner. And sometimes, you know, if you have a weird thought about squirrels or Legos or something, like you want to just keep it to yourself and and, and that's okay. So I wanted to have you mm-hmm. kind of chime in about that, you know? Um in closing to this episode, you know, having someone like you who has a ton of experience, um, sex, dating, self-care, uh, who isn't afraid to share their anxiety, their trauma, um, their depression, their ADHD, someone who has a, a, a very unique, wonderful mind like yours, let's say with all of that, that they're about to shoot you into space and they're like, Catherine, you can say one thing to everyone on your topic, right? On your sex and relationships and dating and anxiety. And I feel you and we'll make sure the human race gets it, but we're going to shove you in this capsule and shoot you wherever. But you get one thing to say, what is that piece of advice? What is that statement? Ah. Uh. This might seem super simple, but it's like your your pleasure matters. Period. Love that. And I think we're we're just not we're just not taught that. Yeah, no, I mean, is there anything more important than that? Apparently not, right? According to you. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. Catherine, yeah. Catherine Drysdale, uh, where can people find you? Where can people work with you? Anything you'd like to say. I will not shoot you into space, but you have the floor. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can find me. I'm more often on TikTok, um, but my handle on TikTok and Instagram is at I am Catherine, C A T H E R I N E, Drysdale, D R Y S D A L E, as well as you can visit my website is yourpleasurepath.com. Um, I have a podcast there. I have self-guided courses and masterclasses. You can also book a one-on-one session there. And if you have a sex-based business where you're wanting support in marketing, branding, et cetera, like you can book a call there as well too. So everything you need is on yourpleasurepath.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you're incredible. And I look forward to, to having you back if you'll come back. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been great. Awesome. Talk soon. Thank you so much to my guest, Catherine Drysdale, for being on the show with me this week. If you guys are loving guests like Catherine, uh, if you're loving Sex Party, if you want more, if you want it to stay, if you want free pancakes every other Wednesday, um, I can't do anything on that last one. But the first two I can. If you are loving Sex Party and you want to show that love and appreciation, you're listening on Apple, you're listening on Spotify, and you're thinking, wow, th- what a great show. I want to support this. A couple different ways you can do that. You can leave a rating. You can leave a review. You can most importantly subscribe to the show. If you're watching on YouTube, what? If you're watching on YouTube, I love you. Um, and if you And if you want to contribute to this madness, you can subscribe to the channel. You can like the video. You can leave a comment. You can tell your friends. You do not have to do any of these things. I appreciate them if you do. I love you all. I'm having a blast. Big things are coming. Hint, hint. If you want to talk to me, you can reach out in the DMs on Instagram. And as always, I will see you right back here next week. Thanks for listening. The party continues next week. Click subscribe and let's make this a regular thing. Follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at SexPartyFM. Follow Dustin at Dustin Ribka.